there's a question, a reasonable question, of, okay, here's this agency, and it's engaged in criminal activities around the world, some of which are quite deadly some of which are quite provocative in, in the sense of laying the groundwork for large-scale military conflict. And it's happening in a lot of countries. This is not unique to the United States. The United States learned some of this from the British, who learned it in turn during the 19th century, where they were a dominant imperial power around the world. They cut their teeth on this stuff. The, and the uh, other major powers are definitely engaged and capable of these same types of operations. And small powers as well. Israel is an example. The CIA grew out of the OSS during World War II, which had been established during World War II. Its earliest years are, are interesting because the new president, Harry Truman, did not trust the OSS because he felt it was too dominated by um, parts of the Democratic Party that he, that he didn't align himself with. So he abolished the OSS. Then they first created a, a smaller intelligence agency from the remains of the old OSS called the Central Intelligence Group. And uh, that was focused on analyzing intelligence. It wasn't a covert operations agency. What Truman wanted was to have one place, one inbox, and in those days, for the younger people who don't know this, actually there were boxes made out of wood, you know, it's an in there, you know. In one inbox would come all information, whether it was from intercepted communications or satellite photography or, or defector reports or clandestine reports, embassy, military, it all come to have one person, and that person, and I, I was one of those persons, okay, that person would be Not supposed to use that word here in Washington, but if, if you promise not to let it get out of this room, it's accountable, okay? One person would be accountable for looking at that stuff, pouring through it, and if it were important, and it often was as working in the Soviet Union, then what you wrote up, assuming it was good analysis, that could end up on the president's desk the next morning. Unadulterated synthesis of information. About two years after that, many of the agents who had worked on the covert operations side, the paramilitary warfare operations, black operations, that sort of thing, uh, were re-established in an outfit called the Office for Policy Coordination. Uh, and this office, quote unquote, eventually grew to have about 5,000 agents in uh, the early Cold War years. Uh, so the, the, and the existence of this office was itself entirely top secret. It had no open existence at all. And it wasn't until some years later that the Office of Policy Coordination was folded into the CIA and the CIA became an agency, this, I'm talking about the early 1950s now, that openly had both a clandestine uh, black operations arm and in uh, intelligence analysis arm. The OPC was set up to organize propaganda, economic warfare, preventive direct action, sabotage, demolition, subversion against hostile states, including assistance to underground resistance groups in support of indigenous anti-communist elements in threatened countries of the free world. What happened at the end of World War II when Truman disbanded the OSS. The covert operators were in the wilderness for a little while. And some of them had been leading Wall Street bankers and lawyers. And there's a certain logic there because prior to the war, the people engaged in international trade and international law were a relatively small number of people, and they were the specialists in international affairs for the United States. So, for example, the man who was later to become chief of covert operations, black operations for the CIA, was a man named Frank Wisner, quite a prominent Wall Street lawyer. 
The man who later became the director of the CIA was Alan Dulles. His career prior to World War II was basically in the international law and, and cutting deals of one sort or another with uh, trade partners around the world. Some of the trade partners included uh, fascists, some aspects of Nazi Germany or companies associated with Nazi Germany, Italy. Prior to the war in World War II in Poland, there had been a military dictatorship, a very authoritarian country. Alan Dulles was made part of his living by, by uh, finance, helping to finance deals that kept that government in power. And there's many other examples along the same lines. During the war, they went into covert operations for the U.S. government because they had ex some expertise in dealing with foreign countries. After the war, they went back to Wall Street for a short time. And then by the late 1940s, they were back in the intelligence complex in the two examples that I mentioned, uh, in leadership and management type roles. From the beginning, the CIA was steeped in elitism. Its top leadership was made up mostly of Wall Street lawyers, while new recruits were sought through the top Ivy League universities. Gaddis Smith, a history professor at Yale, remarked that Yale has influenced the Central Intelligence Agency more than any other university giving the CIA the atmosphere of a class reunion. One Yale institution would prove especially significant, a ghoulish fraternity known as Skull and Bones. Its membership has included some of the most powerful figures in American history. Among them was F. Truby Davison, the CIA's first director of personnel. Skull and Bones gained national notoriety during the 2004 presidential election when it was revealed that the Republican candidate, George W. Bush, as well as the Democratic candidate, Senator John Kerry, were members of the same secret society. The meeting place for members of Skull and Bones is known as the Tomb. Inside are dozens of human skulls, including those of children, as well as that of the famed Apache warrior Geronimo. According to internal records, Geronimo's grave was pilfered in 1918 by George Bush Jr.'s grandfather, Prescott Bush. When in 1986, Geronimo's great-grandson demanded the skull's return, the Skull and Bones Society refused. You both were members of Skull and Bones, a secret society at Yale. What does that tell us? Uh, not much, because it's a secret. <laughs> Is there a secret handshake? Is there a secret code? I wish there were something secret I could manifest. I think the role of most of the secret societies like Skull and Bones, they have histories, as I say, in terms of the splits within the class and also class hegemony. Um, I think when you recruit people and you get them to do something illegal, um, it's similar to what the Mafia does to inculcate somebody. The Skull and Bones picks each, each year have to go and dig someone up out of a grave and commit a criminal act. They, they're uh, required in their initiation to admit to criminal acts that they've been part of or sexual acts they've been part of. So I think it's more that the class uses these secret groups in order to get loyalty uh, and to control the coming generations and other participants in the, in the class operations rather than the other way around that there's 15 people running the world. Um, they do put those people, once they're chosen, into positions of power, and that kind of choosing goes on with or without the secret societies, um, and, and you get a concentration of power and decision making into a very few hands, whether or not they're, they're interrelated uh, that way. The culture of the secret society would find a parallel in the new intelligence agency. Internally, it was known as the company. Within just a few years, it would become one of the most powerful institutions in the American government. Just as Eisenhower would later warn of the military-industrial complex that he himself had helped to create, Truman would voice alarm over the evolution of the Central Intelligence Agency. He came to uh, not only regret it, but to speak out about it. In 1963, 
30 days to the day after the assassination of John F. Kennedy, Truman actually wrote an op-ed that was published in the Washington Post in which he revealed this and he said, I never intended it for it to become what it has become. Uh, and this is very interesting because that op-ed appeared in the early edition of the Washington Post and then it was excised from all the later editions that day. Alan Dulles, perhaps the most important of the CIA directors, flew out to Independence, Missouri to try to get Truman to retract what he had written uh, and he refused. What you find really is that capitalism made the state in a way a site of struggle between the public and the kind of formal institutions of democracy which legitimized the existence of capitalism and uh, the reality that actually in many ways this was a very undemocratic system that wasn't working in the interests of the majority of the population. So there was this constant tension inherent to capitalism between this hierarchical, centralized, elitist dynamic and this need to legitimize itself and to say, no, but we are free and we are democratic and we do have these formal institutions. So on the one hand, that required this discourse of humanitarian interventionism and doing it for the benefit of the public good. But it also institutionalized this new dynamic where covert action would also be um, much more kind of interesting as a way of doing things because again the public wouldn't be aware of it. At the same time the OPC became operational, the National Security Council approved a radical new policy. It secretly authorized the CIA to conduct programs which were officially non-existent, thereby bypassing the US Congress. The NSC ordered that the new operations be deniable, meaning planned and executed, so that any U.S. government responsibility for them is not evident to unauthorized persons, and that for those uncovered, the U.S. government can plausibly disclaim any responsibility. Here, one of the CIA's first covert operators, Kermit Roosevelt, discusses plausible deniability in connection with the 1954 U.S. coup against the democratically elected government of Iran. There was some discussion, and first the doors went around the table, and the only person on the State Department side whom I can remember as uh, taking any kind of a very specific position was Ambassador Henderson, who was back for this meeting. And he said that he wanted to know none of the details. He felt that this was a considerable departure from diplomatic tradition, but he felt it was required by the situation. He wanted to approve it, and he wanted to know as little about it as possible. Allow union infiltrators sufficient lead time. Union infiltrators? Though CIA exposure seems unlikely, standard program of denial of involvement is recommended. Standard program of denial recommended. I made a very deliberate decision not to ask the president so that I could insulate him from the decision and provide some future deniability for the president if it ever leaked out. But there was no denying that the president's men knew what was in the president's mind. And he had been very adamant at the time that he says, look, I don't want to pull out our support for the Contras for any reason. This, this would be an unacceptable option. Isn't there something that I could do unilaterally? Unilaterally. In other words, without that, congressional I approval.
This is a T-shirt. Got it here in a, in Washington on a at a uh, you know one of those outdoor kiosks, and it says, uh, "Admit nothing, deny everything, make counter accusations," and that's really what plausible deniability is about. Plausible deniability gives the people at the top of these agencies, and most particularly the political leadership of the country, which gives orders to these agencies, the opportunity to disavow what has in fact been carried out on the basis of orders that have come from the president. The people on the ground in El Salvador, for example, they know darn well that death squads, I'm talking about in the 1980s, that death squads infest the country and that thousands and even tens of thousands of people are being killed by these death squads. So you can't hide that reality. The people in Washington, in Congress, for example, they are told that there is no association between the U.S. government and the death squads. And in fact, here's a press release, Mr. Congressman, that, that deplores the death squads. The way that that can be done is if there's a disjuncture, if there's a compartmentalization between the CIA and the military intelligence role in these death squads, which we now know to be factual, and they're higher-ups in the chain of command. Now, what was the role of the people down here? Well, that was a little more complicated. So what the U.S. Uh, military advisors do is to teach the people in the country how to organize themselves and how to carry out missions and how to keep their mouths shut about missions and how to be more professional, quote unquote, in uh, the jobs that they, that the indigenous troops want to carry out anyway. It wasn't quite that the American advisors said, thou shall create a death squad and you're going to report to me. No. What they said was, here's how to organize yourself to conduct missions and don't report to me because I don't want to know it. That's how it's done. And then in Washington, back in Washington, the guys who, or, or women too certainly, who are in charge of managing these little units, these paramilitary units around the world, they're saying basically the same thing. Go take care of business in El Salvador and don't tell me about it because I don't want to know. We don't talk about those things in this house, do we? Oh, it's too elegant, too respectable. Nice kids, party, painting a mama up there on the wall. No place for a stinking cup. It's only a place for a hoodlum who built this house out of 20 years of corruption and murder. I'm going to tell you something. You know, you couldn't plant enough flowers around here to kill the smell. There's an attack on the whole integrity of government. If whole file cabinets can be stolen and then made available to the press, you can't have orderly government anymore. A name has now come out as the possible source of the Times Pentagon documents. It is that of Daniel Ellsberg, the top policy analyst for the Defense and State Department. I think it is time in this country to quit making national heroes out of those who steal secrets and publish them in the newspaper. He became a household name overnight. Daniel Ellsberg, a high-ranking Pentagon official, leaked a treasure trove of secret documents to the New York Times. The publication of the Pentagon Papers seemed to affirm a widely held view. No matter how hard you try, you cannot keep secrets in Washington. The very word secrecy is repugnant in a free and open society. Yet Ellsberg himself has a radically different take. He states that the myth of transparency is a cover story, a way of flattering and misleading journalists and their readers. Eventually, many secrets do get out that wouldn't in a full totalitarian society. But the fact is that the overwhelming majority of secrets do not leak to the American public. Secrets that would be of the greatest import can be kept from them reliably for decades by the executive branch, even though they are known to thousands of insiders. One of the most remarkable demonstrations of this capability was the Manhattan Project, 
the gargantuan construction effort responsible for producing the atomic bomb. Though it involved hundreds of thousands of people, not even then Vice President Harry Truman became aware of its existence until assuming the top command after the death of Franklin Roosevelt. How is this possible? Part of the answer lies in the concept of compartmentalization. It's very important to recognize that military intelligence is not a monolithic structure. It's a set of different institutions, it's bureaucratic, um, different agencies are assigned different tasks. And it's precisely because of this bureaucratic compartmentalization and this military hierarchy that different agencies will not know what other agencies are done. In fact, this is how it operates. A particular agency may be given a task to perform a particular component of an operation, but there is this concept of need to know. So for example, the agency may, may or the, even the subsection of the agency or a division of the agency or a cell operated by the agency may on a need to know basis understand what they need to do as a specific component of the operation. They may know that they need they may know they need to travel somewhere and plant a, and, and do some plant a device or they need to go somewhere and, and do surveillance of somebody. But they do not necessarily know why they're doing that or the context or what the strategic purpose is or anything else at all. The purpose of this is to ensure that operations are class are kept classified, that information remains secret that is not subject to uh, being leaked to the public, that is not subject to overt scrutiny from the public or from publicly nominated institutions of the government. Okay, well that sounds logical on, on some levels, but it has the effect of creating compartments in which particular operations are carried out. And these operations on the one hand, may have very significant effects. I mean, that's the whole point of having an operation, right? But the, what the effects are, the existence of the operation, the uh, uh, responsibility for it, and so forth, is secret even within the CIA. You know, the entire career that I spent in the CIA, I was in the analysis half of the CIA the other half being the, the operational half, or you could call it the dirty tricks half, you could call it just the half that did things rather than only talked about things and wrote about things. I was in the analytical half of the agency. Uh, very rarely did people in the analytical half get overseas at all, but I had two lengthy tours overseas in the 1950s for three years in Germany and in the uh, uh, late 1960s, early 1970s for two and a half years in Vietnam. If you just stayed in Washington as an analyst for the CIA, you really were pretty fully compartmentalized away from operational work done in the agency. Uh, you did not have a need to know and the discipline in the agency was pretty darn good. Like most bureaucracies, there's tension between the people at the top of the organization and, and those further down the line. The compartmentalization, in some instances, uh, creates a means for different political factions to write their own foreign policy. One of the reasons we have trouble understanding how things actually happen behind the scenes is because of compartmentalization. Compartmentalization is inherent to intelligence organizations. And so even within a very secret operation, there are many more secret levels, there are many more cells, 
uh, competing factions and what have you. And uh, there are fascinating stories, for example, about how OPC, the Office of Policy Coordination, which really became the hub of the covert operations the CIA would do all over the world. Very often we had situations where the CIA was investigating something uh, and OPC was actually doing something and hiding it from the rest of CIA and putting false material into the files to prevent discovery. And so this is very complex, very deep, very profound material. It's something we need to do much, much more research on. An important compartment of the U.S. intelligence bureaucracy is the NGO, or non-governmental organization. The majority of these groups, American or otherwise, are exactly as advertised. Organizations set up independently of the state, but not all NGOs live up to their title. Like the traditional front company, a seemingly legitimate business run and staffed by criminals or spies, some NGOs have been revealed to be thinly veiled outgrowths of government agencies, including the CIA. The key to CIA's current troubles is that unique American institution, the Tax-Free Foundation. Here is what happened. First, CIA itself set up a number of dummy foundations, calling them by impressive-sounding, if meaningless, names. Their sole function was to channel money from the CIA to a second kind of foundation. Now, these foundations were real some obscure, some well-known, all involved in legitimate philanthropy. But now, in addition, they agreed to become conduits for central intelligence, mixing up the government money with their own, and then passing it on to the ever-growing list of private organizations which, during the 40s, 50s, and 60s, were climbing aboard the CIA payroll. Let's take a closer look at those legitimate foundations which became CIA payout agencies. They are among the 15,000 charitable funds that have sprung up in America in response partly to the social consciences of the rich, partly to the structure of our tax laws. They are the operative arms of what has come to be called the American establishment, the power structure of moneyed families, august law firms, prestigious universities, which have had so much influence in shaping American life and national policy since World War II. CBS newsman Norman Glubach reports on some of the foundations which channeled money for the CIA. This building is 73 Tremont Street, Boston. Just under its windows lies the historic old Granary Burial Ground, last resting place of such revolutionary patriots as Samuel Adams and Paul Revere. The building directory doesn't list it, but tax reports of the Granary Fund show its home as room 329, which turns out to be the law firm of Hemingway and Barnes. No one there would talk before CBS news cameras about the Granary Fund, a reticence which has proved universal among the foundations. But Granary Fund reports are signed by George H. Kidder. Mr. Kidder is listed in Who's Who in America. Among his former associations, the initials CIA. Just the CIA going around behind the scenes and trying to manipulate the process secretly by inserting money here and instructions there and so forth. They have now a sidekick, which is this National Endowment for Democracy. Good morning and, and welcome. It's good to have you all here to help celebrate the launching of a program with a vision and a, and a noble purpose. The National Endowment for Democracy is, just as we've been told, more than bipartisan. The establishment of the National Endowment goes right to the heart of America's faith in democratic ideals and institutions. The attempted 2002 coup against leftist leader Hugo Chavez in the oil-rich nation of Venezuela, reveals the pseudo-NGO at work. Venezuela is important because they're the third largest supplier of petroleum. Um, I would say that Mr. Chavez and the State Department may say this, probably doesn't have the interest of the United States at heart. During the coup attempt, the Bush administration immediately voiced support for the plotters. The Bush administration made it clear it is happy with a change in leadership in the country responsible for 15% of America's oil imports. Initially, many observers attributed the support to an ideological affinity 
between the coup faction and the Bush administration. However, it soon became apparent that the coup was actually sponsored by the United States itself. The National Endowment for Democracy had funneled millions of dollars to Venezuelan dissident groups and politicians, many of whom took up cabinet positions in the short-lived government. In the media, an illusion was conjured of a popular uprising and government crackdown. In reality, Chavez had the support of the vast majority of the population. This was soon made apparent when an actual uprising arose in response to the coup, forcing the Venezuelan military to reinstate the deposed leader. That the CIA has overthrown countless governments around the world is no longer a closely held secret. What is less known is that its agents have engaged in similar plots against America's closest allies. According to the CIA's charter, agents cannot engage in secret operations of any kind within the countries of the UK, Australia, Canada, and New Zealand without the explicit prior approval of the host government. Yet not even this most basic tenet has been upheld. The coup against Gough Whitlam's Labour government in Australia in 1972 exposes a wide variety of dirty tricks used by intelligence agencies to undermine democracy. We will not yield to blackmail. We will not be panicked. We will not turn over the government of this country to vested interests, pressure groups, and newspaper proprietors whose tactics would destroy the standards and traditions of parliamentary government. In Australia in 1972, a Labour government was elected for the first time in 23 years. It would be brought down in a de facto coup d'etat conducted by the CIA in liaison with Britain's MI6 and, most shockingly, Australia's own intelligence services. Since assuming power in Australia, Whitlam's Labour government had enacted a series of reforms. These included raises in wages, pensions and unemployment benefits, free national health care, equal pay for women, the abolishment of tuition fees, new services for Aboriginal peoples, and the replacement of God Save the Queen with Australia's own national anthem. Most disturbing to Washington, however, was the withdrawal of Australian troops from Vietnam, the support of Palestinian rights, and the proposal of an Indian Ocean zone of peace. Worst of all, Whitlam hinted that he might shut down a number of American military bases, including Pine Gap. When CIA Director William Colby petitioned his counterpart at MI6, Sir Maurice Oldfield, for help, he stressed that Australia was traditionally Britain's domain and that if Pine Gap were closed, the alliance would be blinded strategically. Unbeknownst to Australia's new Prime Minister, the Australian Security Intelligence Organization had not only been working closely with the CIA, they had been illegally passing on dossiers concerning every member of the Labour Party, as well as union leaders, peace activists, and other Australian citizens. A slush fund was set up to provide money to both opposition parties via the Nugent Hand Bank, a CIA front company. This was followed up by a promise to the main opposition Liberal Party of unlimited funds. In recent years, there have been charges from time to time that the CIA has involved itself in illegal activities. Some of the most bizarre to date involve a bank in Australia known as Nugent Hand. And tonight, Gary Shepherd has a report. When the Nugent Hand Bank of Sydney, Australia collapsed in 1980, it appeared at first glance to be just another bank failure. But after Australian authorities began taking a closer look, they discovered a tangled web of intrigue with all the elements of a best-selling spy novel, a mysterious death, the body later dug up from its grave, illegal currency transactions, big-time drug operations, and the Central Intelligence Agency. We were to become... Uh the paymasters of the CIA around the world. 
in other words, we were putting ourselves in the position to uh, disperse funds for the CIA to whoever they were directed. Former bank executive Neil Evans, given immunity from prosecution, agreed to talk about the Nugent Hand operation on Australian television. From his account and others, the bank had its genesis during the Vietnam War. Four of the original stockholders were Americans who listed their addresses as Air America, Army Post Office, San Francisco. Air America was the CIA airline in Indochina, hauling men and supplies on clandestine missions. And according to former CIA agents, even drugs out of the so-called Golden Triangle, where the borders of Burma, Laos, and Thailand converge. Nugent Han sent Neil Evans to the Thai city of Chiang Mai, the commercial center of the drug trade. He claims the CIA made millions and used the money to finance some of its secret projects. The idea was that money would be deposited with the Nugent Hand Bank by the CIA through various channels and also that the Nugent Hand Bank would be the repository for funds coming in from various um, CIA enterprises, namely drugs in Thailand, marijuana in particular, and that the bank, the Nugent Hand Bank, would then be responsible for rerouting that money to an account in America with a New York bank. Nugent Hand was not your ordinary bank. There were secret numbered accounts, and hardly any of its top people were bankers. Many were American civilians and former high-ranking military officers with ties to U.S. intelligence. When they found the body of Australian businessman Frank Nugan, the bank's chairman, shot to death a few months before the bank went under, they discovered in his pocket the business card of this man, William Colby, former director of the CIA. Nugan's partner was Michael Hand, an American Green Beret who served two tours in Vietnam, one of them for the Central Intelligence Agency. He disappeared a short while after the bank collapsed and is now believed to be dead. Australian newspapers reported a connection between Nugent Hand and the U.S. Navy's super-secret intelligence unit known as Task Force 157. Among its top agents, CIA man Edwin Wilson, now under indictment for selling arms and explosives to Libyan dictator Muammar Gaddafi. And a man named Patry Loomis has also been implicated. He was the apparent CIA Nugent Hand go-between. It was Loomis who helped Wilson recruit a team of Green Berets to train terrorists in Libya. The Nugent Hand affair has caused an uproar in Australia where authorities are trying to find out what involvement the bank might have had in the 1975 downfall of the Labour Party government. Meanwhile, investigators on three continents are attempting to trace 50 million dollars missing from the accounts of depositors, including many Americans. Here in this country, the CIA denies any involvement with drug operations in Indochina, the Nugent Hand bank itself, or the deaths of the two men who ran it. Gary Shepard, CBS News, Los Angeles. In addition to the slush fund, the CIA created a series of forged documents implicating high-ranking members of the Labour Party in a succession of scandals. No hard evidence was ever produced to substantiate the allegations, but a complicit Australian media, spearheaded by a young Rupert Murdoch, fanned the flames of discontent. Do you think the new paper will have any political orientation like the Sun and its predecessor, the Daily Herald? No, no, no fixed uh, orientation in the sense that it will be allied to any party. Certainly not. It will be quite independent. One of the most damaging of the forgeries was a report indicating that Labour ministers had received kickbacks during the so-called Loans Affair. In 1981, a CIA contract agent named Joseph Flynn admitted that he had forged these documents at the behest of Michael Hand, co-founder of the CIA's Nugent Hand Bank. As the contrived scandals escalated, a state of emergency was declared. Invoking the authority of the British Crown, Attorney General John Carr dismissed Whitlam as Prime Minister.
When compared to many other leaders targeted by the CIA, Whitlam and Wilson got off easy. The CIA attempted to assassinate several dozen leaders during the Cold War. Oftentimes, they succeeded. La gran humanidad ha dicho basta y ha echado a andar. Y su marcha de gigantes ya no se detendrá hasta conquistar la verdadera independencia. This is Fort Detrick, Maryland. This once secret facility was home to CIA experiments with drugs like LSD. It was also an armory for the agency's executive action capability, a program begun under the Eisenhower administration for disposing of unwanted foreign leaders. Some of the plots called for lethal poisons that were manufactured here. Dr. Everett Hennel, a microbiologist at Fort Detrick for three decades, worked in association with the CIA. These are what we call class three cabinet systems. They're gas tight systems for working with almost complete safety with any infectious diseases, toxins, things such as the shellfish toxin. They're very toxic indeed, particularly when highly purified. And uh, I understand that these could be placed on steel needles and fired with air guns uh, into an animal and induce death almost uh, immediately. So that they were apparently a very effective or could be a very effective uh, type of uh, covert weapon. Among the most disturbing CIA documents from the Cold War period is the agency's how-to guide on assassination. Beginning with the ironic disclaimer that murder is not morally justifiable, it goes on to state, the killing a political leader whose burgeoning career is a clear and present danger to the cause of freedom may be held necessary. Persons who are morally squeamish should not attempt it. From there, the guide highlights potential methods. The simplest local tools are often the most efficient. A hammer, a screwdriver, a fire poker, a kitchen knife, a lampstand, or anything hard, heavy, and handy will suffice. A length of rope, or wire, or a belt will do if the assassin is strong and agile. For secret assassination, either simple or chase, a contrived accident is the most effective technique. When successfully executed, it causes little excitement and is only casually investigated. The most efficient accident is a fall of 75 feet or more onto a hard surface. Elevator shafts, stairwells, unscreened windows, and bridges will serve. Falls into the sea or swiftly flowing rivers can suffice if the subject cannot swim. Arson can cause accidental death if the subject is drugged and left in a burning building. Reliability is not satisfactory unless the building is isolated and highly combustible. If the subject drinks heavily, morphine or a similar narcotic can be injected at the passing out stage and the cause of death will often be held to be acute alcoholism. Puncture wounds of the body cavity may not be reliable unless the heart is reached. The heart is protected by the rib cage and is not always easy to locate. Absolute reliability is obtained by severing the spinal cord in the cervical region. This can be done with the point of a knife or a light blow of an axe or hatchet. Another reliable method is the severing of both jugular and carotid blood vessels on both sides of the windpipe. But the officers of the CIA do it because they love this country. We believe in a free and open society, and we deeply believe in upholding the laws and the values of this society. That's why we defend it, so that, in the words of my immigrant father, we can pass those values on to our children. 
What sort of philosophy could possibly justify such carnage? During the Cold War, the official justification was to prevent the spread of communism and to promote what was termed the national interest. What does national interest mean to you? If you have the feeling that there is some document that is revised every year or every couple of years, some document that exists in the U.S. government that is headlined uh, U.S. national interests, and every year or every other year this has gone over carefully by groups of people high in the government and approved, these are our national interests. That never, ever once happens. <clears throat> every single administration uh, has and is able to make up as it goes along what it thinks the U.S. national interests are. Every single individual who works in the government uh, may very well have in his own mind a list of what he thinks the national interests of the country are. Neither the phrase national security nor the phrase national interest has real meaning other than to be a political tool for keeping the public uninformed. Essentially, the elite, in its ignorance and in its obsessive desire to maintain secrecy and not be accountable to the public, seeks simple explanations. They seek reasons that they can use as a jingle that will allow the public to believe in what they're doing or to ignore what they're doing. What most Americans don't realize is that we, the people, are being held accountable by foreign publics for what is done in our name. Almost immediately after the CIA's founding, the national interest was revealed to be a highly flexible frame of reference. In the coups against Mohammad Mossadegh in Iran and Yokobo Arbenz in Guatemala, neither country had communist governments nor any links to the Soviet Union. What they did have were leaders who threatened to nationalize major industries, thereby threatening the profits of Western corporations. In Iran, it was oil. In Guatemala, land. I'm John Perkins, and I'm a former economic hitman. What we economic hitmen did essentially was to create the world's first truly global empire. I was recruited by the NSA uh, while I was uh, attending Boston University back in the 60s. Uh, they put me through a series of tests, including lie detector tests, uh, psychological tests. And in that process, uh, they determined that I had the potential for being a good uh, economic hitman. They also discovered a number of weaknesses in my character that would make it fairly easy for them to hook me into doing this job. And so they, they offered me uh, a job as a trainee. And it's interesting, you know, when you, when you accept a job like that with the NSA, they don't tell you exactly what you're going to be doing. They tell you that for the next year or so, you're going to be training. And then at the end of that period of time, they'll really determine what you're going to be doing. But ultimately, I ended up becoming an economic hitman. We did it by using many different means, but perhaps the most common was to identify a third world country with resources that our corporations covet, like oil, and then arrange a huge loan to that country from an organization like the World Bank or one of its sisters. But that country never actually received the money. Instead, the money went to our own corporations to build big infrastructure projects in that country, like power plants and industrial parks, things that would help the very rich people in that country, as well as our own corporations, but not the majority of the people who are too poor to buy electricity or don't have the skills to get jobs in industrial parks. And yet they, the whole country, would end up ho holding a huge debt, such a big debt that they couldn't possibly repay it. When I lose, I pay, and when I win, I expect to get paid. I don't ask anybody to trust me, and I don't trust anybody. Big shot or penny anti chiseler. But I tell you, I haven't got it. If I had, I'd give it to you. Now, don't be like that, Blackie. Give me a couple of days and... So at some point, we economic hitmen go back and say, listen, you owe us a lot of money, can't pay your debts, sell us your oil real cheaply, or vote with us on the next critical UN vote, or send troops in support of ours to some place in the world like Iraq. And in that way, we've created this empire. On the few occasions when we economic hitmen fail, the jackals go in. And these are people who will overthrow governments or assassinate the leaders of the countries that didn't accept the loans. I failed as an economic hitman with Jaime Roldos, the president of Ecuador, and Omar Torrijos of Panama, 
and because I failed to corrupt them, failed to bring them around, failed to get them to take on these loans that were so destructive to their countries, uh, they were both assassinated by CIA-supported jackals. The words economic hitman and jackal are kind of tongue-in-cheek words. We, we use them, uh, but it's like the word spy or, or snoop or um, spook or even CIA agent. Uh, people don't really use any of those terms. If you're a true CIA agent, spy, uh, you may talk about it tongue-in-cheek, but, but you've got a fancier title like uh, uh, attaché, commercial attaché at some embassy. Uh, we economic hitmen all had fancy titles too. My title was chief economist. But we would use this term economic hitmen tongue-in-cheek. And the jackals, uh, usually people who work for private, sec what they call security firms, or a company that'll have a semi-legitimate contract with some branch of the government to do something such as protect our personnel in an embassy overseas, or maybe protect a media crew overseas, and, and they'll be paid to do that. But there'll be one person uh, in that organization whose money is coming through these other channels. And sometimes the channels are what they call the black box money is from the CIA, money coming through these channels for, to hire this one person who is essentially an assassin. On the few occasions when the jackals and the economic hitmen both fail, then we send in the military. When you have an empire, you have to ask yourself, who's the emperor? Well, an emperor is someone who's not elected, and doesn't serve a limited term, and doesn't report to anyone. We do have a group of people that I call the corporatocracy, which are the people who run our biggest corporations, who do fit that definition. They're not elected, they don't serve a limited term, and they don't report to anyone. They like to say they report to their boards of directors, but they're all on each other's boards of directors, and they, the boards of directors basically rubber stamp what the CEO wants to do. So this is the modern equivalent of the emperor. They're all driven by one single motive, one goal, and that is to maximize profits regardless of the social and environmental costs. And in heading for that goal, they've created a world that's very dangerous, uh, very unfair, unsustainable, a world that I certainly don't want to pass on to my grandson. Beginning in earnest under President Clinton and expanding still further during the Bush Jr. and Obama administrations, the use of private contractors by the United States has increased dramatically. Bearing names like Titan and Aegis, they are the modern equivalent of the mercenary army. Today, I can report that as promised, the rest of our troops in Iraq will come home by the end of the year. When President Obama announced the withdrawal of troops from Iraq, many Americans did not realize that thousands of mercenaries, funded by the U.S. taxpayer, would remain in place. From saving costs, these private contractors have repeatedly robbed the U.S. taxpayer for millions of dollars. But from a military intelligence perspective, they perform useful purposes. They establish plausible deniability. They further minimize congressional oversight. They bypass rules of war, such as the Geneva Conventions. And they create enormous profits for their benefactors. A case in point is DynCorp whose clients have included the Drug Enforcement Agency, the Department of Defense, Department of State, the IRS, FBI, and of course, CIA. About half of DynCorp's revenue comes from the Department of Defense. Every day, the people of DynCorp International are hard at work supporting defense, diplomacy, and development initiatives. Because we believe in the relentless commitment that has made us a leader in providing government support solutions. With 22,000 employees in 39 countries, we provide total support, 
in aviation and land systems, logistics, training and mentoring, intelligence, international development, anti-corruption, and base operations. We believe in doing the right thing always for our customers, our employees, and those we serve. In 1999, it was revealed that employees of DynCorp were not doing the right thing. They were working with the Serbian Mafia in the trafficking of sex slaves, including children. Mr. Secretary, I watched President Bush deliver a moving speech at the United Nations in September 2003, in which he, mission, he mentioned the crisis of the sex trade. The President called for the punishment of those involved in this horrible business. But at the very moment of that speech, DynCor was exposed for having been involved in the buying and selling of young women and children. While all of this was going on, DynCor kept the Pentagon contract to administer the smallpox and anthrax vaccines and is now working on a plague vaccine through the Joint Vaccine Acquisition Program. Mr. Secretary, is it policy of the U.S. government to reward companies that traffic in women and little girls? Um, uh, thank you. Uh, representative the first the answer to your first question is is no absolutely not the policy of the United States government is uh, clear unambiguous and opposed to uh, to the activities that you described the um, second question well how do you explain the fact that um, DynCor and its successor uh, companies have received and continue to receive government contracts? I would have to go and, and find the facts, but there are laws and rules and regulations with respect to government contracts, and there are times that corporations do things they should not do, in which case they tend to be suspended for some period. There are times then that, that the, under the laws and the rules and regulations for the, that uh, passed by the Congress and implemented by the executive branch, that corporations can get off of the pen, out of the penalty box, if you will, and, and be permitted to engage in contracts with the government. They're, they're not generally not barred in perpetuity. This contract, this company um, was never in the penalty box. If you could proceed to my second question, please. DynCorp was not placed in the penalty box and was soon back to its old tricks. In 2009, WikiLeaks cables revealed that DynCorp was arranging sex parties for Afghan politicians involving small boys. One of these politicians was the Minister of Education. Nor has the intelligence bureaucracy itself remained idle since the founding of the CIA. Under the Reagan administration, a new player emerged, JSOC, or the Joint Special Operations Command. JSOC was ostensibly created as a response to the failed 1980 hostage rescue attempt of American embassy personnel in Iran. It went on to conduct operations in Honduras, El Salvador, Nicaragua, and countless other nations. The basic premise that I was saying is there's a unit known as the Joint Special Operations Command, JSOC. It's a separately independent unit that does not report to Congress, at least in the years I know about. And I spent, if people read a story I wrote last summer in New York, or the Congress people are very upset at the senior leadership. It has been given executive authority by the president in as many as 12 countries to go in and kill. We're talking about high value targets. That, that's absolutely correct. Recently, it was revealed that JSOC has been training members of the MEK, an Israeli-backed terrorist group on U.S. soil, at the very same time that MEK was cited on the State Department's own list of terrorist organizations. If they're killing people that we like, it's not terrorism. By the way, we should add that the Brits and even the EU have basically moved away from that terrorism name because, again, they like having these guys. I mean, if somebody else can do the dirty work and you can make an absolute denial, as we have seen from the likes of our Secretary of State, who said, we are absolutely not involved in the assassination of these five scientists. And we have absolutely said it definitively. Isn't it nice to have an organization? I'm not saying, suggesting this is the organization, but it's nice to have an organization that can do something 
something so you can say, it wasn't me, it must have been somebody else. You know what I mean? The United States now has 16 separate intelligence agencies, ranging from the ONI, the Office of Naval Intelligence, to the DIA, the Defense Intelligence Agency. Admiral Dennis C. Blair, whom President Obama appointed Director of National Intelligence, disclosed in 2012 that the current annual budget for America's 16 intelligence agencies is a remarkable $75 billion. More than the entire military budgets of major powers, such as the UK, France, and Germany. It employs more than 200,000 operatives worldwide, many of whom are mercenaries. Giving the intelligence community more money is like pouring gasoline onto a fire. It is a really bad idea. But there's no oversight, there's no accountability, and therefore they'll go on. I mean, General Hayden, who's now violated the Constitution twice, once with wireless wiretapping, the second time with torture and rendition. Hayden is on record as saying that any time he wanted to close down a program at NSA, the guy who would lose his status and his money and his program was the only one who could tell him about it. So no oversight has really created a monster. There are 16 intelligence agencies. It turns out that the State Department, which costs almost nothing, produces the most value with open source intelligence, with information that is not stolen and is legal and ethical. Uh, then you have the CIA, which has a mishmash of analysis and a mishmash of clandestine collection. And then after that come the technical agencies. The National uh, Security Agency, which does signals intelligence, including warrantless wiretapping, um, and some other elements. And the long and the short of it is that we're spending 60 to 75 billion dollars, of which CIA spends no more than 6 billion. And we're spending it on things that don't work. Lockheed will spend a hundred million dollars of the taxpayers' money on a satellite and it'll self-destruct on the launch pad and Lockheed will be given a contract to build another one. I mean, this is nuts! Policymakers are so stupid they would rather a secret picture than an intelligent human analysis. And so the whole system is rotten. The next president can safely cut the secret budget by 80% and move that money into education and open sources and do vastly better, not just for America, but for the rest of the world to whom that information can be given for free in, in sense-made form. So right now our government is completely out of touch with reality and it's the Keystone cops on steroids and armed. Okay? I mean, we're really in deep, deep trouble here. Have a nice day. <laughs> <laughs>
Its headquarters, nicknamed Crypto City, employs over 40,000 people, more than the CIA and FBI combined. As documented by journalist James Bamford, it encompasses 525 acres with floor space totaling more than 7 million square feet. Its yearly consumption of electricity is 409 million kilowatt hours, equaling Maryland's capital, Annapolis. It has its own film festival, yacht club, and ski club, with yearly trips to Austria and Switzerland. Its budget for 1995 to 1999 totaled $17,570,600,000. Apparently, not even this was enough. In 2012, Wired Magazine reported that the NSA was building an even more gargantuan complex in Utah. A former NSA official, quoted in the article, claims that the United States is now a hair's breadth from becoming a turnkey totalitarian state. Though the official mandate of the NSA is to eavesdrop on foreign communications, we now know that it has long been pointing its instruments inward. In the Philippines, circa 1950, CIA Psy War operative Ed Lansdale employed a technique known as the Eye of God. At night, Operatives would paint an eye on the wall of a house facing a suspected communist or communist sympathizer. The message, we are watching you. In some respects, the NSA's well-publicized spying on American citizens has the same effect. In the late 18th century, an English social theorist named Jeremy Bentham designed a prison known as the Panopticon. It was a circular structure with a central command center built so that prisoners would never know if they were being watched. French philosopher Michel Foucault stated that the goal was to induce in the inmate a state of conscious and permanent visibility that assures the automatic functioning of power. Regardless of intent, NSA agents can only analyze a tiny portion of the information they intercept. Yet, the very fact that they have claimed the right to spy on American citizens is a gross violation of their mandate. Similarly, the CIA, which is prohibited from conducting internal security functions within the United States, has repeatedly broken its own rules. Under Operation Chaos, the agency spied on leftists during the civil rights era. Under MKUltra, they used thousands of American citizens as human guinea pigs. During Operation Mockingbird, they illegally propagandized the American public. Do you have any people being paid by the CIA who are contributing to a major circulation American journal. We do have people who submit pieces to other to American journals. Do you have any people paid by the CIA who are working for television networks. This, I think, gets into the kind of uh, getting into the details, Mr. Chairman, that I'd like to get into an executive session. It, it is a great honor to be here with the men and women of the CIA. I've been eager to come out here uh, to Langley for sometime so I can deliver a simple message to you in person on behalf of the American people. Thank you. Thank you for all the work that you do to protect the American people and the freedom that we all cherish. Today, it is widely accepted that secret organizations with extraordinary special powers are necessary for stability 
for democracy, and for defense against foreign enemies. Yet this viewpoint has not always been the dominant one. In a modern history of England, published in the 19th century, its author notes, nothing is more revolting to Englishmen than the espionage which forms parts of the administrative system of continental despotisms. The freedom of a country may be measured by its immunity from this baleful agency. Similarly, in 1798, a congressman colorfully warned that if a system of espionage is established, the country will swarm with informers, spies, and all the odious reptile tribe that breed in the sunshine of despotic power. If the corporatocracy has become the de facto emperor of the United States, the shadow government has become its elite guard. In the late 1980s, CIA whistleblower John Stockwell compared the military intelligence complex to the praetors of ancient Rome. The praetors came to exercise great power, Stockwell wrote, making and unmaking emperors and allowing political and military action outside of the law. What rules that were observed were announced by the issuance of edicts. The guard was characterized by corruption and political venality and was closed down by Constantine in 312 AD. 353 years earlier, Julius Caesar crossed the River Rubicon. Roman law specified that only elected magistrates could hold imperium or right of command in their provinces. Therefore, Caesar's act directly challenged the power of the elected government. Today, the idiom, crossing the Rubicon, is used to describe the devolution of a republic into an empire. It is also used to mean a point of no return. I start to believe If I were to leave Things guy the man changes His hands held high A cruise beyond Cruise me, babe A plan to leave beyond, beyond, beyond Oh, <laughs>